I would like for you to close your eyes and join me in a deep breathing exercise. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Open your eyes. Last year, I found myself in an unusual situation. My boss, Jacob Hansen, asked me if I would like to lead the people function at Cobalt.io. The thing is, my title is Chief Security Strategist. I've worked in security for almost 15 years. I'm very passionate about people. That's why I created the Humans of InfoSec podcast. But I've never actually worked in human resources before. Jacob said to me, look, we're really on to something here. The company has found product market fit, and our impact on the industry continues to grow. Now the most important thing we can do is to focus on our people. In 2019, we will elevate Cobalt.io's people function to be a world-class organization. To do this, we must build an environment that cultivates personal and professional performance, growth, and happiness. In order for Cobalt.io to be successful in the near and long term, we must attract, acquire, and retain great talent. Today, I lead both people and security at Cobalt.io. When I joined the company three years ago, I was the eighth employee. Today, the team is 92 people strong, and we expect to grow to 105 by the end of this year. It has been super fun, and I'm really excited to see where the journey takes us next. So that's a little bit about why, why people matter at Cobalt.io. Next, I'm going to talk about AppSec and why people matter in AppSec. I'm going to talk about what we're able to accomplish as humans that machines can't do. I want to address our industry's skill shortage and the resulting burnout that many of us experience. I want to share an example of some cognitive behavioral therapy that I've worked on personally. And I want to conclude with takeaways for both hiring managers that are trying to build and retain great teams, as well as for each of us as individuals. So why does AppSec matter in the first place? It's because the internet was never intended to do what it does today. In 1969, four university computers at UCLA, Stanford, USB, and the University of Utah were connected via ARPANET, a project started by the Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency. In 1985, the National Science Foundation established NSFNet, a network of scientific computers that served scientists, researchers, and engineers who worked for the National Center for Atmospheric Research. These people studied the atmosphere and its interactions with the oceans, land, and sun. A decade later, the internet was being used to support electronic commerce. During a 1998 US Senate testimonial, a group of security researchers explained that the internet was not designed for it. They described the academic and scientific objectives of getting computers to talk to each other. Quote, the internet grew up, it flourished, it struck everybody by surprise, and now big business is saying, well, let's jump on board and make some money off this. Well, this is kind of like if you've driven in Boston. The streets aren't tremendously designed in a wonderful fashion because they followed the cows around and laid the pavement down. I mean, you can get it to work, but it can be really painful. In 2003, the first version of the OWASP Top 10 was published. And in 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote, software is eating the world. And so here we are. 
Application security is a problem because we use the internet for things it was never designed to do. And so many things depend on software. When value shifts from the physical world to the digital world, protecting that value has to shift too. Today there is tremendous demand for application security talent and not enough supply. The latest ISC Squared research study on the cybersecurity workforce reports that the world is in need of almost three million more security professionals. How do they come up with this number? The study states this calculation takes critical factors into consideration, including the percentage of organizations with open positions and the estimated growth of companies of different sizes. The calculation of demand includes the openings that are currently available, along with an estimation of future staffing needs. And the calculation of supply includes estimates for academic and non-academic entrants into the field, along with estimates of existing professionals who are pivoting to cybersecurity specialties. The thing is, that just like any other business initiative, a successful application security program needs the right balance of people, process, and technology. Tools are useful, but no tool is a silver bullet. And any type of application security technology still requires people and the right workflows to be effective. I want to talk for just a moment about why, unfortunately, all of our application security problems can't simply be solved by using technology. The thing is that computers are really good at doing exactly what you tell them to do. They're not so good at thinking creatively or applying business logic. Even the most sophisticated machine learning techniques are still vulnerable to concept drift. The idea that machine learning predictions are made by using pattern matching against old data. The old data never exactly matches the new data, so the predictions can never be exactly right. To me, this is sort of obvious. If someone built a machine that could accurately predict the future, that would be awesome. To my knowledge, this does not exist yet. I want to share an analogy that has to do with using a machine to correct spelling errors. Let's talk about a spell checker. Spell checker is extremely useful, but it's not perfect. Look over there at the drawing on the whiteboard. Their ideas are articulated nicely. They're going to take a picture and share it with the rest of the team. A spell checker program sees nothing wrong with the spelling of these words but a human does. Similarly, when it comes to something like finding security vulnerabilities in software, computers can't find everything. Only humans can find business logic flaws. And these are some of the most interesting and most severe security vulnerabilities that exist. In his 2011 OWASP presentation called How to Prevent Business Flaws, Vulnerabilities in Web Applications, Marco Morana highlights password reset flaws, username recovery flaws, and the following e-commerce business logic attacks. Altering the price of an item before checkout and bypassing payment validation before shipping an item. It would be super convenient if you could just buy a piece of technology that would do everything for you. Unfortunately, application security scanners and firewalls can't solve everything. Their effectiveness is directly related to the skills and the manual effort of the people who must tune them to a specific environment, monitor them regularly, and filter the signal from the noise. Okay. The internet wasn't built with security in mind. The world has a massive skills shortage, and we can't rely on automation to solve everything. What's happening to the people in this scenario. If you're on an application security team, I'm willing to bet that you have more work to do than time and resources to do it. Maybe one of your colleagues left for a new job last month, and there are two additional unfilled positions on your team. You could actually be in a position where you're trying to do the jobs of four people. 
An ISSA study found that 70% of cybersecurity professionals feel impacted by the talent shortage, resulting in an increased workload and a situation where teams spend more of their time fighting fires than focusing on training, planning, or strategy. This is the perfect setup for burnout. Burnout is described as a state of chronic stress that leads to physical and emotional exhaustion, cynicism and detachment, and feelings of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Severe burnout means that you can no longer function effectively on a personal or professional level. The tricky thing is that burnout doesn't happen overnight sort of creeps in gradually in this sneaky way that fools us into thinking that living in a state of constant stress is normal and acceptable. Living in a state of constant stress is not normal, and it should not be acceptable. Our industry has a burnout problem. We have a massive skills shortage, and for as long as that's the case, it is absolutely critical that the professionals in our industry take care of themselves. Because the world needs us. What we're capable of bringing to the table as healthy, happy, functioning professionals is simply too valuable to lose. Early in my career, I used to put up with being treated poorly because I thought it was normal. I used to treat myself poorly too. I don't do that anymore. Self-care begins with believing that you deserve it. I want to talk to you about a concept called cognitive behavioral therapy. The basic idea is that our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are all connected, and that you have the power to change, or at least influence one by changing another. To do it, you identify a negative thought process and you try to change it into a positive one. It's easier said than done because our negative thought processes are often so deep-seated in our brains that we don't even realize that they're there. I'm going to talk through a personal example. My parents are immigrants and they raised me to be able to take care of myself and to have as many choices in life as possible. When I was growing up, doing well in school was a really big deal. As a child and teenager, I did well in school, and that felt good. But when I started the electrical engineering and computer science program at UC Berkeley, all of a sudden, that part of my identity changed. It took me decades to develop the core belief that I'm smart and I work hard. Unfortunately, over time, I also began to develop a few associated core beliefs that are quite negative and self-defeating. My worth comes from my success in school and in work. If I am not constantly exceeding expectations, then I am a failure. I need to work harder, and unless I am succeeding, I don't deserve to be treated well. Over the past 10 years or so, I've worked hard to try and replace these negative belief processes in my brain with positive ones. I accept myself as I am right now. I know myself and I approve of myself. I embrace balance. I encourage myself to play and to, enjoy, and to enjoy life. It's time to shift gears and talk about some key takeaways for hiring managers. I'm going to share some of the strategies that we use at Cobalt.io to attract, retain, and grow great talent. First, you want to attract great people. I'll tell you what, when it comes to application security, Pretty much everyone with strong skills and experience already has a job. They're not super likely to go to your company's job website and submit their resume. That's not to say that inbound candidates can't be valuable, but you can't rely on them alone to fill your positions. 
You've got to be proactive and opportunistic when it comes to recruiting. You need to go out and find the people that you want to hire. You will need to do a lot of outreach. If you have a great recruiter, this person can help, but I think the best person to do outreach is the hiring manager. I know that this takes time, and that time is a precious and a finite resource. It's a matter of prioritization. If you want to attract great people, you need to make hiring a priority. If you find someone amazing, and they don't happen to exactly match your original job description, consider revising the job description or changing your hiring strategy. Once you've made an offer to a candidate and they've accepted, your next priority should be to keep them, assuming they perform. Some employer retention programs have perks like free snacks and paid gym memberships, but I've come to realize that what really matters to people is something different. In 2012, Google conducted a study to try and figure out how to build the perfect team. They examined everything from how frequently people eat together to common traits between the best managers. They analyzed 180 teams throughout the company and reviewed half a century's worth of academic studies on how teams work. Surprisingly, the data didn't seem to show that a mix of specific personality types, skills, or backgrounds made any significant difference. It turns out that what does matter is something called psychological safety. A sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. Teams are always going to have their issues, regardless of whether people talk about them or not. Team members that trust each other are more likely to share information so these issues can come to the surface and be managed efficiently and proactively. Another thing that it's absolutely critical for hiring managers to do is grow their people. I think this matters even more when it comes to application security. It's important for every business function to have well-defined levels so that team members understand what is expected of them in order to get to the next level. Reviews don't have to be onerous, but they should be structured so that team members can have productive conversations with their managers about where they are today and where they're headed tomorrow. High-performing individuals should be acknowledged and promoted. When I began my new role as head of people at Cobalt.io, I asked our people operations manager for a book recommendation. She told me about a book called Sapiens. One of the concepts that this book talks about is how humans can create and maintain culture through one-on-one -on -one relationships. This works until a group is about 100 people big. After that point, something more is needed to support and enforce cultural values. When Cobalt was growing from eight to 50 people, it was easy enough to involve pretty much everyone in the hiring process. This way, we made sure that every single new hire added to our culture in a positive way that aligned with our core values. As we prepared for growth from 50 to 100, we knew it was time to write down our values in order to scale people decisions on who to hire, who to promote, and who to transition out of the company. Jacob and I did not sit down privately and write these things down. In January, the entire team, we were about 50 people at that time, got together for a Q1, Q2 kickoff in Miami. And at the end of our sessions, Jacob said to everyone, please stand up, we're gonna stand in a circle. And then one by one, he called about a dozen of our employees into the middle of the circle. He said, Robert Kugler, please stand in the middle of the circle. I think that Robert exemplifies Cobalt.io values because he has amazing enthusiasm and optimism. And then he invited everyone else to talk about what Cobalt values they believe Robert Kugler demonstrates. 
people said Robert gets his hands dirty. He just does it. He's collaborative. He's always trying to figure out how to make things faster and better using automation. And then Jacob asked Julie Kurt to step into the middle of the circle. He said, Julie takes initiative and she has amazing energy. People chimed in and they said, we love her positive attitude and her optimism. We love that she cares so deeply and she's so dedicated to her work, that she has a strong work ethic, that she gets things done and takes responsibility. Jacob said, Wolfgang, please step into the middle of the circle. Wolfgang is humble and he is a great listener. The team chimed in and they said, Wolfgang stands his ground. He's not a pushover. He's appreciative and he shows gratitude. He also follows through. Jacob said, Marion, please step into the middle of the circle. Marion is structured and she's systematic. People chimed in and they said, she's humble. She's hardworking, she's motivated, she's a sweetheart, customers love her, and she gets shit done. So in this way, meanwhile, I'm sort of like frantically typing into a Google Sheet, and I'm writing down all the things that people are saying. And over the next couple weeks following the offsite, I invite the entire company to join me in this Google Sheet and add their contributions, and together, we come up with the following. At Cobalt.io, we are humble learners. What we did yesterday may not work tomorrow, so we approach problem solving with a creative growth mindset. We understand that occasional failure is part of a natural learning process when trying something new. We humbly seek to learn from subject matter experts, mentors, and advisors. We believe that everyone has something to contribute. Where we have skills and experience, we share our knowledge generously and patiently with others. At Cobalt.io, we lead with grit. We know that achievement comes from a strong work ethic and relentless execution. We do not quit when the going gets tough. We are committed to high integrity. We do what we say and we say what we do. We take responsibility and get things done. Our leaders are in the trenches with us. We find solutions, not problems. We innovate and we make things happen. We own our results and we create our success. At Cobalt.io, we produce quality at speed. Our customers and pen testers inspire our high standards. We set goals, make plans, and follow through. Our success measures and action plans are transparent and smart. Our questions, decisions, and actions are data-driven and KPI-focused. We seize opportunities. We know there is no time to waste. We say no to what is not important and deliver the right results at the right time. At Cobalt.io, we know that when we collaborate, we can make 2 plus 2 equal 10. We respect our colleagues and we value each person's unique contribution. We genuinely believe in the Cobalt.io vision and care deeply about our customers, pen testers, and colleagues. We recognize the critical importance of each constituency to Cobalt.io's continued success. We celebrate team wins and show gratitude for one another. We lift each other up. So that's some stuff for hiring managers. Here is some stuff for all of us. I want to tell you about something that I realized a few years ago. For those of us that have and are developing skills in application security, there's a beautiful silver lining to the, to the skills shortage, and that is that we have choices. In 2016, my daughter was a year old, and it was becoming apparent to me that my lifestyle as a traveling management consultant needed to change. I began to search for a local job, and I spoke with 15 different organizations about various information security roles. That's an extremely fortunate position to be in. For me, one of the coolest things about becoming a mom is that my sense of what I want and what really matters to me has become much clearer. In the past, I've worked on toxic teams. I've worked in toxic work environments. It sucks. During my job search in 2016, the number one criteria I looked for 
was people that I like and respect who like and respect me. It turns out that being surrounded by people that I trust makes my life a lot better. Every single day when I can go to work and look forward to seeing my team, that's a good day. My number two criteria during this job search was the ability to have a big impact. And that's why for the first time in my career, I decided to join a startup. And it's been awesome. I have another recommendation. And this is something that I have worked on myself. We are so good at learning stuff about technology and about security events. We are pros in getting all the technical details right. It's a different thing to try and get to know yourself. Sometimes that's actually harder to do. I recommend that you try to get to know yourself, that you pay attention to how you feel, and you manage your energy accordingly. There are a lot of techniques and strategies about managing one's time. But what about your energy? There's only 24 hours in a day. But depending on your energy level, you can either feel completely depleted and like you have nothing left to give, or you can feel inspired, like your tank is full and like you can accomplish anything. Find out what gives you energy and what takes it away from you and choose your activities accordingly. Sometimes people ask me what kinds of self-care things I do for myself. And so I thought I would share some of them here. So I've broken this out into three categories, mind, body, and spirit. Meditation is something that for me was actually pretty intimidating to try and start doing. But luckily, they make iPhone apps for this kind of thing. So you can just download a meditation app and press play and just listen and just close your eyes. And it actually does not a bad job. Journaling is another one of those things that can be hard to make time for. I was going through a difficult period in my life in the winter of 2012 and 2013. And I tried an exercise that had been recommended, me to, uh, recommended to me by a friend. She said, put a notebook by your bed. And when you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you do, even before you pick up your phone, and even before you walk over to the bathroom, grab your notebook and write down anything. Write anything down, just fill a page. And you never have to go back and read it. But there's this interesting thing that happens when you're transitioning from sleep to being awake, where I actually believe you can get some information from your subconscious that's harder to access when you're awake. Side note, that particular exercise, which I did for about a month, uh, led me to a very important decision, which was to divorce my first husband. That was like, one of the best decisions I've made in my life. I've been going to weekly therapy for a decade now, and there's something super cool about talking to someone for 50 minutes, and the whole point that person is there is to listen to you. And they're not a part of your life. They're not in your life. They don't have any agenda or objectives. They're just there to listen to you and to support you. And there's something really awesome about that. Even if you have great friends or great partner that you feel like you can talk to, which is a wonderful thing. Um, for me, having a, an amazing therapist uh, provides something different in my life that has been hugely beneficial to me. I'm medicated, and that really helps me. Um, I have insurance. so. In addition to struggling with depression and alcoholism, I also struggle with anxiety. 
Now that I have two young children, I struggle with a whole another kind of anxiety. And so I bought life insurance. And now I feel a little less anxious. I think it's really important to take vacation. And you don't have to take three weeks and go to Bali. You can take a day and do nothing. I think it's really important, if this is your thing, to do art, to create something that has no particular productive use, uh, but which is purely for your own pleasure. When it comes to self-care techniques for my body, I try to get sleep. I try to nourish myself. Uh, it turns out I love cooking. Sometimes I try to exercise. Uh, and I wrote care. And what I mean by this is, like, go to the doctor. Like, when's the last time you went to the doctor? Uh, I, myself, <laughs> uh, have not been to the doctor in, like, a while. And it's because it always feels like it's not that important, that it could always wait, that I can't carve out, you know, three hours in a day to book the appointment and commute over there and wait in the waiting room. But really, I should go to the doctor, uh, and so forth. Uh, and spirit, I think that it's important to try and surround yourself with people that you like and respect, who like and respect you. I think it's important, and we have a unique opportunity in this industry, to choose a job where you can have real impact. We have that opportunity in this industry. I think it's super important to spend time with family and friends and pets, and to create tribes of people. I think it's important to have a gratitude practice Sounds pretty cheesy, uh, but another thing that I do to combat my personal anxiety is when I, this is something that my therapist and I work on together, when I have an anxious thought, I try to replace it with a grateful thought. There's this idea that the mind can only hold on to one thing at a time. If I'm busy thinking about what I'm grateful for, there's less room in my brain to think about what I'm worried about. And it's nice to have rituals, whatever that may mean for you. So now I'm going to end my talk with a guided meditation. <laughs> I'll ask you to indulge me and consider closing your eyes. We're going to start with another few deep breaths. I am at peace with myself. I appreciate who I am. I value myself as a person. All people have value, and I am a valuable human being. I deserve to relax. I deserve to be happy. I embrace my happy feelings and enjoy being content. When my mood is low, I accept my emotions and recognize that the low mood will pass and I will be happy again. I look forward to the good times. My future is bright and positive. I look forward to the future and I enjoy the present. I look fondly upon many memories from my past. I forgive myself for my mistakes. All people make mistakes. I used to feel regret about some of my mistakes because I'm a good person and I want to do the best that I can. And now I'm still a good person and I release the feelings of regret because I've learned and moved on. I forgive myself for errors I have made 
because I have felt bad about them long enough. I have suffered long enough, and now is time to be free. By freeing myself from past mistakes, I can move on and do good things. I forgive myself. I imagine and believe that these things are true for me right in this moment, and I enjoy the relaxation that I am experiencing. I feel good about who I am today. I accept the person that I am. I accept my flaws. I accept my strengths. I view my shortcomings as strengths not yet developed rather than as weaknesses. I eagerly develop new strengths. I imagine and believe that all of these affirmations are true for me right now in this moment, and I enjoy the relaxation I am experiencing. I approach challenges with strength. I do the best that I can at the time. I give 100% effort when I am able and when I choose to put full effort toward the things that are important. I accept my imperfections and the imperfections in what I do. My efforts are good enough and they're okay. I do not have to be perfect to be okay as a person. I am a human being with flaws. I enjoy being who I am and I love myself as I am. I feel secure in who I am and I do not need to compare myself with others. All the strength that I have ever had is present in me today. I still have the same positive character, even if not all of my strengths are shown right now. I have all of those strengths of character and will use those strengths again. I imagine and believe that all of these affirmations are true for me right now in this moment and enjoy the relaxation I am experiencing. I accept myself. I care for myself. I take time for myself and enjoy it. I deserve time for myself, and I feel good about taking this regularly. I handle difficulties with grace. I allow myself to experience and express emotions, both negative and positive. I accept myself. I am perfectly all right, just the way I am. I accept myself. I am a valuable human being. I accept myself. I feel confident. I accept myself. I feel secure. I accept myself. In a moment, I'll count to three. One, take a deep cleansing breath in, and exhale slowly. Two, take another deep breath, and exhale. Three, open your eyes. You are feeling calm, confident, and refreshed. Thank you. So we have some time if you want to talk. And if you want to talk, there are some microphones. They're right here. And if you want to, you can walk over to one of the microphones and you can talk. Hello. Thank you. Uh, do you have some thoughts on practical ways to help uh, teams do more self-care? I've certainly been in teams where I say, hey, you work the weekend, take the day off, and that, that doesn't help other uh, employees actually go home. How can we encourage this behavior uh, with our team, you know, other than just telling them to do it, which, which doesn't work? 
I think that's a fantastic question. How can I help my team do more self-care? I actually think that the best way to do this is to lead by example. So if you say to your team, hey, we just spent the last three weeks recovering from a major incident. I appreciate all the work you've done. I am gonna take a few days off, and I think you should too. I do not expect to see you in the office. Another thing that I do personally is, I actually talk about my therapy at work. So on a Friday afternoon, I meet with my therapist at three o'clock. And if I'm in the office and it's two o'clock, I begin to pack up my bags and I say, bye. I'm going to my weekly therapy appointment now. I'll see you guys on Monday. Uh, there's another thing which, this is like, applies to some people more than others. Uh, but for me personally, I, I used to wear a lot of makeup and I used to spend a lot of time on like my makeup and hair. Uh, and now I don't. And most of the time, I am actually wearing a little makeup right now because this is being videotaped. But in general, I don't. <laughs> and, uh, and I go to the office and I do video conference calls all day. And I noticed other people in the office coming to the office with less makeup. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I think that a lot of it has to do with seeing a leader do these things for themselves. Um, I've actually had, so Cobalt.io is a security vendor. We have a presence at the RSA Security Conference. I'm actually on their advisory board. I planned to attend that conference from Saturday to the following Friday. And when I left my home, my husband and my two young children were both sick. And I said to my husband, if the baby's temperature goes over 102, I'm getting on a plane and I'm flying home. And on Tuesday afternoon, I'm in the middle of a panel talk and my phone starts beeping. Right now my phone is on airplane mode. And my husband says the baby's fever has hit 102. And as soon as the panel's over, I go to my boss and I say, Jacob, my baby is sick, I'm going home. And he says to me, how can I help? And I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, well, I have three more talks to do this week, so if you could do them, and he was like, I will help you figure them out. He actually personally took one of them, uh, and I asked a, an amazing friend and colleague to, to do a couple on my behalf. Jacob said to me, you know, Caroline, I actually think that by you choosing to prioritize your family in this way, he was like, I think you're actually gonna get asked to do more speaking engagements. He's like, I think it's great for your brand. I was like, cool. And then I looked at his calendar this week, and during our one-on-one -on, -one on Tuesday morning, I said, Jacob, I saw that you have AppSec DC on your calendar. I'll be there too, we should meet up. And he said, actually, I'm going to Iceland. And I was like, cool, what's in Iceland? He was like, there's a boys trip with my friends from high school. And he said, ever since I started this company six years ago, I've never gone on the boys trip because I thought it wasn't worth my time. I thought that, you know, I'm the CEO of this growing company, I should be at work. And he said, but I realized that life is short, and so I'm going to Iceland. And I said, great. Let me know what I can do to support you, uh, and have a great time, and be safe. I just want to say thank you for being so vulnerable here today for people. I mean, what you shared there was impressive, and uh, there's probably a lot of other people, myself included in this room, have gone through things like that. And it's imperative, I think, for leaders, not only in this field, but uh, anywhere in life. If you're a parent, you're a leader. If you're in your community, you may be a leader, certainly in this field, too. And uh, touching on all three, the body, mind, and spirit, we're not machines. You know, we're human beings, and we're made up of that. And it's so imperative that we take care of all three 
where we end up drying up and being like a prune, right? So thanks for sharing what you did today. You're welcome. I kind of wanted to wait to see how uh, awkward it would get, but, and this isn't like the kind of question maybe you're thinking of, but w listening to your talk and about vulnerability and about therapy and kind of leaders we're hearing, it reminded me a lot of Brene Brown's talk on vulnerability in her books. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Awesome. Um, so I guess I would like to hear more about maybe how, which concepts of hers you've tried to take consciously into your current role going from, you know, technical security, it sounds like, into a big, you know, holistic people responsibility, which is a big responsibility and extremely important. Thank you. So I am familiar with the work of Brene Brown. If you are not familiar with her work on vulnerability, I highly recommend her TED Talk. She also has several excellent books. She basically says that all humans really want connection and that a good way to actually establish connection is by being vulnerable. This is not aligned with a lot of the world's cultures. It's also not necessarily aligned with our industry's culture. Our industry is all about finding problems and trying to prevent problems and trying to fix problems. And so we're always so aware that there are so many problems. And then in some places, we're like not allowed to talk about the problems. And that creates something funny. I have done over the past couple of years different versions of this talk. There's another version of this talk that I gave at B-Sides in San Francisco where I go like pretty deep into some of my own problems. There was a woman who watched my talk that day in San Francisco and she said to me, how open are you with your coworkers about this stuff? And I said to her, I'm pretty sure this talk is being videoed and it's gonna be available to the public on YouTube. So I'm super public about it. That does not mean that you need to be public about your story. It's taken me a long time to get to this point and there's also all sorts of weird stuff that I'm not gonna stand on a stage and talk about. The reason I've chosen to do this is twofold. One of them is because if somebody who hears this talk can relate to something that I've said, then that person might feel a little less alone. And if somebody hears this talk and feels inspired to share something about them with someone that they trust, then that might help them too. I think there are baby steps. Not everyone needs to get up on a keynote stage and tell the world about your mental health problems. That is not for everyone. But you could tell your best friend or your sister or your therapist, or you could write an email to yourself. Uh, so there are all these ways um, where I think that self-awareness helps on the journey to self-care and happiness. And the most important person to, to think about these things is you. If you choose to share them with someone that you trust and that you feel like is gonna respect what you have to say and support you, then that's awesome. Uh, but it's, it's totally up to you. I am very, very impressed from your speech, from your talk, and it personally uh, motivates all of us I write here. One question I have for you is like, 
if you find someone in a position like uh, um, they do care for people, they have the right feelings for everyone else, right? It could be social, it could be work-related, or it could be any, any place. But sometimes when you feel like that the perception that people have developed is not who you are, then what would you recommend to overcome that situation and help them that may help someone to overcome that barrier not being perceived differently than who they are? So if I can paraphrase that, what I think I heard is sometimes people are well-intentioned and they can be misunderstood. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, correct. And what do you do about that? I think that it's, okay, so we have this cultural thing where Culturally, we are encouraged to like smile and like we greet each other and we're like, how's it going? And sometimes when people ask, you're like, you don't actually give a shit about me. You're just saying that because that's what people say and you're just expecting me to be like, great. And that is, we have this like avoidance of conflict thing. And the avoidance of conflict gets in the way because for functioning relationships, it's good for us to be straightforward and honest with each other. I'll give you an example. I have an amazing recruiter on my team. And he said to me, the hiring manager gave me the impression that this role is supposed to have person A and person B reporting to him or her. This other stakeholder is under the impression that the new role is supposed to have person C and person D reporting to him or her. What do I do about it? And I said, you should write a message in black and white to the hiring manager and to the stakeholder and say, I think I've identified a disconnect. My understanding is that you think that this role is supposed to manage person A and person B, and you think that this role is supposed to manage person C and person D. I'd like for all of us to talk about it. And I think this can, I think this can apply when a person is well-intentioned and misunderstood. In the United States, we have this thing that happens where we have lots of different people with different cultures. And what is a sign of respect or a sign of affection or a humorous thing to one person might be strange or offensive to another. And so sometimes we have to spell these things out. And it's totally fair to say, hey person, I observed such and such behavior. I heard you say such and such thing. And the way that I interpreted it was A and B and C. Was that the way that you meant for it to come across? I would like to talk with you about it. So I think that, you know, that's one idea. Um, I wonder what advice do you have for parents or would-be parents for how to teach the concept of failure and how to recover from it to their children, which I've seen recently um, that a lot of parents are enforcing an absolute success like you uh, talked about. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a topic that I think about a lot because I have kids and I personally struggle with, on one hand, a desire for my children never to experience any pain or suffering. And at the same time, a recognition that they will experience pain and suffering and there's some things that are mistakes that they need to make on their own. I like for my kids 
to make mistakes and fail in front of me. Because then I can say to them, you tried, and it didn't work out the way that you thought it would, and you should try again. Sometimes there are safety things. I have a four-year-old daughter, and we've been to the emergency room twice in the last six months. One time, she was running around in the kitchen with her socks on, and she tripped and fell, and her teeth cut into her lip. And the face and the mouth are like a very bloody place. It was just like uh, you know, and we go to the ER, and she's fine, thank goodness. Her teeth actually didn't go through her lip, so she didn't need stitches. And now she knows <laughs> that she shouldn't run around with socks. Uh, another time, she thought it would be a good idea to put a small piece of apple in her nose to see what would happen and then she couldn't get it out. And so we went to the emergency room. And we did get it out. When I take my daughter to the park, so at four years old, she's actually pretty capable. At two years old, she was less capable. Some parks have a section for little kids and a section for big kids. And sometimes the sections for big kids have climbing structures. And I am the type of parent who I encourage her to climb the structure. And I stand right next to her. But I don't help her. Because if I help her, then my concern is that she might get higher than she's capable of managing by herself. But if I just stand there and she says, Mommy, help me. And I say to her, I'm not gonna help you. I'm gonna stand right here and you're gonna help yourself. And if you're not ready, then that's fine. And that kind of puts it like in her, in her own um, thing. The other thing I try to do with my kids is I try to be honest with them. My hope is that by being honest with them, they'll trust me more. <laughs> and they'll do what I say. It doesn't always work. So I explained to my daughter, the oven is hot, the stove is hot. She actually has not had that particular issue yet, which is great. My husband rides a motorcycle. He explains to my daughter, after daddy gets off the motorcycle, the motorcycle is hot. We have some friends of hers over the other day and she says to them, don't touch the motorcycle, the motorcycle is hot. And so, for me, it's like the difference between saying, don't do that because I said so, versus don't do that because here is a natural consequence. We are out of time. I would love to continue these conversations. You can find me in all the social media places, um, and I will just be hanging out. I'd love, I'd love to talk. Thank you so much.